Uh, we're so glad that you're here and that the weather allowed us all to be here. I'm Danielle Knapp. I'm the Makash curator uh, who had the pleasure of working on this exhibition with uh, George Green and Jerry Heiss and so many members of the George D. Green Art Institute and the artists in the show. So it's such a pleasure that the four artists who all live out of town and took time out of their day to drive here and speak about their work are with us today. And I'll try not to uh, talk too long because we want to give most of our time to them. We'll start with Richard Thompson's painting. Um, we'll ask that, I'll be sort of the timekeeper and we'll ask the artists to talk about their work a bit for 10 or 15 minutes. And we should have time for one or two questions along the way for each artist. If you have more questions than that, um, it's, you know, the artists who are speaking today and some of the other artists who are in the show are all here. And so there'll be time for conversation one-on-one -on -one after our hour, hour and a half is spent on the, the formal part of the tour. And let's see, I think I had, let me make a few more remarks. Oh, I'm giving a lecture in April, um, which is more of a sort of curator's response and reflections on the show, a little bit of history, a little bit of um, sort of how the exhibition came together and any other insights that I decide to share as I put together that presentation, which will be April 3rd, uh, Wednesday night at 5.30, if you want to join me for that. And then our last gallery tour will be Saturday, May 4th at 2 p.m. Uh, on the topic of the human figure. So hopefully you'll come back for, for that opportunity to hear from four more artists in the show. For all of these gallery talks, we used sort of the thematic uh, groupings as just a starting point. Certainly, the artists that will speak with you do more than that in their work. Um, they can talk about more than that in their work. And you can ask questions about more than, in this case, landscape and environment. Um, but we wanted to really showcase the diversity of the work that these painters are doing. Um, sometimes from a sort of a common starting point, how far they take that in their work. So just so pleased that you're all here. Uh, and I've talked enough. So <laughs> Richard Thompson, please. Thank you. Do I have it right here? Thank you, Close. Does that work? This is a stand-up comedy routine, my first one ever. I only have uh, 10 or 15 minutes, uh, so, and I have a lot more to say than that, so I'll try to limit myself. Here. First of all, special thanks to Danielle, put this together, George, Jerry, who brought all of us together. You know, I think the average age in this room of the artist is about 70 years old. And when they had the opening a few weeks ago, the, most of the conversation was about hips and knees. <laughs> have you had, will you have, are you scheduled to have a knee, a hip? What is it? Where are you? In the, the... And I say that because it's a special group of people. And I often think that the importance of this group of artists in this room, and think about this, being in our 70s now, uh, when we started making art in the 19, late 50s, early 60s, George Johansson, I guess, would be in the late 50s, Picasso was still alive. Many other artists who defined painting in, through the 20th century were still working. So we are contemporaries of Picasso. Just think about it in that way. And as such, for most of us, if not all of us, our education at university, our art education, began as a modernist education. We were trained, we were schooled, the language we used, the artists we looked at, the examples we were given for a life in art, what it was like to have a life in art, were defined by European modernist and American modernist artists. That was our, our, our goal. This hat, if you go back and look at photographs from the 1950s of artists in the studios, you will see Ferdinand Leger wearing this cap in his studio. So we, they were our guides, our, 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 um, our leaders, as it were. They defined the world we entered. They, they provided us with the work ethic, the goals, they provided us with a structure and a framework into which, which to work. And many of us went on, as myself and others, who did work in university for many years and have seen the changes occur. The modernist art education is not as common, not as prevalent, and not as respected. For us, it was a world we loved immediately. And I've taken some notes, and there was, let me try to get, pull this up. I lost it, my phone. But I, I was trying to define what, in the simplest sense I could, what that education was about. What, were the, what was the structure of that that brought us forward? And it was that the, that the visual world 
was a shared world. But the art that we created from daily experience was singular and individual. And there was nothing better for that than landscape painting because who knows where the trees are, right? For the viewer, there could have been 30 trees. The painting wasn't about how many trees there were. The painting was about the art. It was about making the art, and you were making it up. You were creating a world. You were, the canvas was a laboratory on which to explore feelings and ideas and a place in which artists could create these individual worlds, but it was based on the shared experience of living in the world, on the landscape. Now, there were artists such as Mondrian and others who eventually refined that into a much, uh, a much more, a smaller world in a way with larger spiritual applications to it. But nonetheless, it was still based on this shared experience. It wasn't, it was not conceptual art. It was visually anchored in the observed world. All of us, uh, I believe, who went through that education and who our age, we did a curriculum that was of 2D design and color and life drawing and all of those traditional structural artistic uh, matters. And then we, we knew to then take those tools and transform them into art and the landscape for me and for others in this exhibit was a perfect place to do that because it is, it is unknown in a way and we make it up as we create the painting. So I also mentioned too that for those of us who are of this generation, there is an inherent tension uh, in our world as artists, in our life as artists. And that was that we recognize this world that goes on inside our brain and that that information that we have up here about all the paintings we've seen the respect we pay to other artists the legacies that we carry all of that's in our brain has to come up against a fact a material fact and that is that paint in itself canvas in itself are neutral, they're inert, they have no substance on themselves. It's only what we bring to that. And in that tension is a risk. So every time we start a new painting, it's like a pitcher starting an inning. It's all starting again. It all begins again. It all, blank canvas, paint, all starts again. And for those of us in this room, then I, I joke about this, about the hips and the knees, but it's our materiality, too, that we struggle against. It's our own physical limitations. And what I admire about this generation of artists has been their profound ability to transform the, those physical facts, that the materiality of the world in which we're working, to transform it into light and space and content into the X factor whatever that is beyond subject matter that you respond to. So that's why I paint landscapes. It's what I was trained to do, it's what I love to do, and it's what really allows me the greatest latitude to provide and share with you a visual world that we all live in and yet bring to that some idiosyncratic expression, some, something about memory or something about something that forms that, what I call that buzz in the brain, that where it transcends and becomes art. Any questions? <laughs> yes, sir. You in the back in the red shirt. Yes, sir. And, and the cap. With a leisure cap. <laughs> would, you, would you care to describe at all the, the difference, perhaps, between the way you see the landscape as a fisherman and the way you see the landscape as a painter? No, I don't think there's any difference at all. I think that when you've been, and for you, Eric, and for others, what happens after you've painted over 50 years, when you've done it this much, your brain sees paintings everywhere all the time. It just does. You, you, you're driving, you're walking, you look at a bug, you, you see a painting. It doesn't matter, you see paintings. And the, the issue for you, for me, 
is to the process whereby I narrow that visual uh, information into something coherent I can work with. So it doesn't, that, that stimu all that stimuli doesn't drive me crazy. So I draw, I draw all the time. When I'm fishing, I'm seeing stuff. When I'm driving, I see stuff. When I'm uh, here in this room, I see things. And I don't know what it, I don't know how other people's minds work, but I do believe that uh, after 20 years of painting, yeah, after 30, yeah, after 40, and when you get 50 years of doing this, it's just a constant uh, sea painting world. It's just color, shape, form, you know, all the time. So it's more of a process of, of, of bringing down to something manageable. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Uh, not copying so much, but certainly uh, learning from in some direct ways. I mean, I, I don't think that you could be a young artist in America uh, in, the, in the 60s. The, this show is built around those of us who began in the 60s and 70s. So we were, we f ate that information all the time. And you would, I don't know how many of us in this show got a chance to actually see paintings. You know, uh, we saw magazines, we saw slides, we saw, we saw a lot of other visual information. So I didn't know what those paintings really were like until later in life. But you could guess, you could try to figure that out. Like, how did he make that surface? Where does that color come from? And I also think that uh, the, our education was grounded in observation. It wasn't grounded in theory. It was you, you look at that person, that you learn how to do that. You learn from observation, and then you put that together with this crazy stuff going on in your brain, and you try to work it out. So I would say it was a classical late 1950s, early 1960s university curriculum <laughs> that, that informed most of us, which was which actually was quite good. I mean, look how many of these artists in this room are still working, still standing, and still creating. It's, it's a remarkable legacy. I, I, I think so many of the people in here, George and I, and, and remember so many of the people who were our teachers yesterday. They really made a big impression. When you're from Dayton, Oregon, a town of 613 people, you've been cleaning cow manure all your life and bucking bales and driving tractor, and then you go to meet somebody like Nelson Sangrid or J, uh, uh, Demetrius Jameson at Oregon State. It's like the whole, whole world opens up. It's, it's quite impressive. Yes? Uh, can you some of your thoughts of painting behind you? Uh, the confusion of two spaces at once. Uh, if you look um, over the last uh, 20 years, I've been trying to figure out what this means to to what this landscape in front of me means to see and paint. And so I've done a lot of paintings that worked off the concept of the horizon line of the eye level, where the human sees that. This painting simply has two different eye levels in it. And, uh, and it, a lot of the things that I think about at the end when I narrow down my paintings comes when I drive in my pickup across Eastern Oregon or something. And there's something in this painting and some others about the, about the flatness of the road as a as an object in itself, and there's a quite a few of the paintings have this kind of stand up straight non perspective road in it. And this is one of those, but it's two the two spaces that we occupy at once. Now we're going to sing. No. <laughs> uh, what is the difference between subject matter and content? This is my wife, Kimberly Contreras. <laughs> without whom uh, I can't get through a day. Uh, this is something we talk about a lot. As, well, we talk about meaning in politics and how come she's a Marxist and I'm not and all these wonderful things. Um, this is a really good question, and I've been trying to figure it out for a long time. Uh, there was an English uh, an aesthetician 
who wrote uh, books about content uh, in the early uh, 20th century. And he talked about how that there was something called significant form. It was a concept of aesthetics that had, I didn't understand it then, I don't understand it now, but the concept grabbed me. The idea that there is this X factor in art, that the subject matter, it's, it's the, the marriage, as it were, in alchemical terms, the marriage, the coming together, the, the, the totality of the materiality of the work, along with the uh, creative intent of the work can form into something greater than those two parts. And you may make a thousand paintings in 10 years, and they're all good, but there might only be one in that, where that wedding. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. I don't think people who don't paint get this. And I mean no disrespect, I just don't think we talk about it enough. When I paint, when George paints, when Bob paints, when Eric paints, and everybody else in here, we are physical beings. And what we come to know about ourselves is that at any moment, the pressure we apply to that brush in that microsecond is different if I push like this or if I push like this. And that, that that distance between that life of that brush mark and the totality of all the, all the other brush marks is, what a, is, the, is the truth of painting. You know, and it, every brush mark adds up to this culmination of it. And we make, all, you know, I don't know how many brush marks are in a painting, but a lot, a lot. And you at each each brush mark is a thought. Each brush mark is a, is is it that color? Is it that color? Is it that color pressed, going right to left horizontally, with this much pressure, or is it a lighter touch coming from the top left to the right? What is that? That's how. And those those the variations in there are all the unknowns. But you're trying to orchestrate all that. So. And I, because at the end of the day, you want to make art. And art is something we don't talk enough about. I mean, we're talking about paintings. I'm, I'm trying to, I still would like to make something in my life that I can stand back and say, that's art. Made by a kid from Dayton, Oregon, who used to shovel cow shit. And that's the best fucking art you're going to see. But it's art. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. So if we want to just turn ourselves to look at Sandra Rumigo's painting here. We'll have Sandy come up to speak about her work. If you came in... A uh, hard act to follow. <laughs> I thought it would be easier going second. It's going to be harder. <laughs> uh, first, I want to thank you, Danielle, um, for putting this exhibit together. And, of course, George and Jerry. It was, it's just absolutely wonderful. And it's been such a thrill to see. Uh, I thought I'd talk very personally about the image and how I go about it. And my knowledge of, about how to paint and painting started at OS, OSC, it, it wasn't OSU then, with Paul Gunn and Nelson Sangren. And it involved drawing, composition, color, technique, everything. And from the beginning, I've considered myself a figure and landscape painter. I started with the traditional still life and when weather permitted work from the landscape. My study and painting of the landscape was based on the mid Willamette Valley and the coast around Newport. The painting uh, was from what I saw or thought I saw and that's the big catch. Are you seeing what you're seeing? And I say it is a representative of a sense of place. I have a difficult time when traveling to paint landscapes that, I, that are unfamiliar to me. Uh, we moved to the south, um, to the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, and the landscape, the geology, 
I didn't relate to. I wasn't able to paint that landscape authentically. Ah, say it for me. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I was close, but no scar. Um, anyway, for the painting, uh, for me, uh, painting and drawing are welded together. After years of drawing classes and lessons and teaching drawing, my favorite is gesture and the line. I get pretty excited how with line, paint or charcoal or any other um, dry media or wet, one can cleave two shapes together. Each shape describes the other shape, and yet they are separate. I, when I paint, draw with the brush. I don't make preliminary drawings, but prefer to grab the brush, load it with paint, and begin. I do, however, have a particular composition in mind and have researched it visually. Lots of looking, and when um, uh, looking, I use the cookie cutter, uh, as you do in perspective space, to cut out your peripheral vision, but I'm looking at sections of the of the landscape. So when I'm seeing, I'm going to take a, a, a fragment of it and basically blow it up. Um, with my gestural approach to painting, I paint large. Um, I am cramped using a six, or, you know, an 18 by 24 canvas, and that is because I do paint very physically. Um, I paint with the whole arm. I paint with the body. I always thought if I could smear myself with paint and rub through it, I, I would love to do that. And I do have a love of oil paint. I, there's no better smell than an artist studio who uses oil. When you walk in there and the Damar varnish and the oil, and it's just like heaven to me. Um, I finished my BA and MFA, although I would say my... Um, basics were learned here, right through um, Oregon State. We're at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. And the reason for that is my husband who finished his PhD here at the U of O, his first university teaching job was at the university. So I was one of those women who always painted, even though they worked at night. And um, that was when I had the gall, I think now after having taught, that I went to the art department at Oregon State, knocked on the door, and this was so long ago, this was when uh, Dr. Gilkey was head of the department, and asked Paul Gunn and also Nelson Sanger, and if they would come to my house, which was a rental, and teach uh, for six weeks in a row for a price. And I promised that the uh, students, we would be very, very serious about painting, and we were, I mean, we never missed, and we had so much fun. And we would start at 7, and sometimes we would end at midnight. How I made it to work the next day, <laughs> I often wonder. And that was with not having to start the wine. Nelson said we couldn't start drinking till after 10. <laughs> and so <laughs> that was, we did that for many years, traded off uh, with the two uh, profs. Um, when I was in Arkansas, that's when I began to add political and social commentary to my compositions. Um, I chose subjects that made me foam at the mouth, completely galled me, or scared me. And the deciding factor was how passionately I felt about the subject matter. When we lived in northwest Arkansas during the decade of the 70s and early 80s, I completed a series on the Ku Klux Klan. I inadvertently attended a Klan family picnic in Rogers, Arkansas, where <clears throat> there were many selling their homemade crafts. It was when I noticed the children's Klan outfits that it sunk in. That's <laughs> then when I moved back to Oregon in the early 1980s, I painted clear cuts, still do, guns in our day-to-day -day lives. And when <clears throat> I exhibited the gun series, my show was 
protested by the um, Amendment 2 folks because they wanted equal time and they put their literature and demanded to put their literature in the gallery with my paintings. And this was much to the horror of the owner. And she didn't ask me to show there again. <laughs> I took offense. Anyway, um, in, then I continued with uh, religion, social uh, commentary, and um, issues like tires in the landscape. And then I also uh, published a book with the help of the Oregon Coast Council for the Arts called uh, Heaven Bound. And it is a book of 21 paintings and 21 poems. And then there is a disc in it that has uh, music that goes with it, who uh, was composed and played by one of the band members of Rick Bartow. So it's, it really turned out to be a great uh, publication. I realize I don't paint happy pictures. When I try to be happy, I produce paintings that Paul Gunn used to say were too picturesque for words. But I am working on Serene. I uh, graduated from Corvallis High in 1958. I was a farm kid. Uh, George and Jerry, Hugh Webb, Carolyn Hansen, her, her maiden name. Um, we all took art from Mr. Bates and he was one of the best high school art teachers I think there was. Um, let's see. Oh, and then of course, in, in studying with um, Nelson Sandgren um, and Paul, I was introduced of course to Dave McCosh, David McCosh, and loved his work. And then C.S. Price and Mr. Otis, uh, the alter ego of the writer Stuart Holberg, and I think the University of Oregon did a show of, of uh, Mr. Otis's paintings. I have all of his books and writing on that. And then, <clears throat> of course, Milton Avery, Max Beckman, and then in the South, I was interest, uh, introduced to black artists like Bill Trailer. Uh, he was the son of slaves, and he did most of his work in Little Rock, Arkansas, and I saw <coughs> a collection of his paintings there, absolutely gorgeous. Um, I continue painting, I'm one of those older ones, and I'll drop over in my studio. I don't see myself as old, I'm surprised when people call me dear or honey, and the ideas for paintings come too fast for me to paint. And then I have dropped my active political servant, uh, uh, I spent 10 years as a member of the OCC, which is the Oregon Coast Community College Board of Ed, and then eight years uh, in Newport as an elected city official uh, beginning in 2010. First two years were city councilor, and the last six years as mayor of Newport. Um, lots of people in the League of Oregon Cities. I was the only um, member of the League of Oregon Cities who was an artist, and so, I kind of, that was kind of fun to have, and they didn't quite know what to do with an artist any more than the artist knew what to do with the mayor. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I wouldn't give up that uh, time, and it was so much uh, that I learned, but a steep learning curve. Um, a few, two examples of my frothing at the mouth series are the ones on the tires and the landscape. Um, I don't make these things up. They come from observable nature, uh, what I see. Uh, when we were looking for property for the college, and I was chair of the um, education board at, at the time, we were looking for land to build the campus, and we were out in duff to our hips with mosquitoes, and I was tripping over tires. And this was uh, second logged uh, land we were looking at, which just blew me away. And then on the Ku Klux Klan, I was horrified to see how the Klan was in the South when uh, moving there. I ended up, as I said, at a Klan picnic, and they were, <coughs> when I was stopping to use the county park restroom on my way to uh, St. Louis, and that experience just shook me to the core. And I want to say, with ending, what a pleasure it is to be hanging on the wall with all of you, the artists, it's just so thrilling, but especially with Bob DeZono. 
I've been a fan of his work since I first saw it. It's been close to, what, 30 years, haven't we known one another? Something like that. Longer. But he always, you're, you keep mentioning that you are younger than I. <laughs> yes, a couple of years. <laughs> anyway, um, it is, again, um, a pleasure, and I thank you for the chance to talk. And <laughs> Any questions? Maybe if there's questions later too, they can grab you and talk to you if there's nothing right right now. So let's thank you so much for sharing that. We'll move down to the center of the gallery to look at Sudell McCulloch's painting. Sudell uh, McCulloch will talk to us about her work, Spring and Clover Time, and then we'll talk about Bob Dezano's work. And, and so uh, let's just go ahead and let Sudell get started. <laughs> thank you all. And oh, and our videographer, he will move to this area when Bob starts speaking. So just so you're not startled when the equipment starts moving around to the side, just make space for him. We appreciate that a lot. Thank you. First thing I have to do is learn to hold this. Tell me if you can hear me. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody who's, res who's responsible for this marvelous show that I still can't believe I'm in. But thank you so much to George and Jerry and to Terry Melton, and to Danielle for doing this whole amazing curating. Um, and I want to just tell you a little story about why I do landscapes. I am a landscape painter. I've done a lot of other painting. I've done still lifes and abstracts and figurative and lots of other things. I've even done bronze cast sculpture. But I am a landscape painter. And that is kind of hard to justify at this time and age. Why representational landscape when we have fabulous cameras and we have virtual reality and we have a million images coming to us all the time that are usually of some gorgeous place with probably a four-wheel drive dashing through it. But it's, we, we see landscape all the time, but I paint landscape and I care about the environment because of where I grew up and how I grew up and of course when. And that is, I was born in Panama. My father was down there repairing war damaged ships and my mother came down and joined him and then eventually I did too. So I, that's where I, have my first memories of light and landscape. And I still remember the contrast of tropical light and taking long, slow drives through jungle areas. And I, I, I do have those memories. They're kind of becoming more memories of memories, but I still have those. And from there, we arrived on ship to New York and came in the harbor there. And crossing the ocean, I got to see flying fish. And there was another fabulous experience that has stayed with me forever. We pulled into the harbor, and it was very foggy. And we were all on the decks in heavy, kind of smelly, icky sort of life jackets. And I looked out through the railings, and here is this enormous woman rising out of the fog as a column of light. Just amazing. So I have that memory, too. Then we drove all the way across country and ended up in Klamath Falls. And my father had worked there, and that's where we stayed for a few years. And when we arrived in Klamath Falls, it was snowing. It was snowing. <laughs> what in the world was that? Well, it was pieces of light. And I have that vivid memory, too, of getting out of the car and experiencing snow. I still love snow, even though it's a bother. <laughs> um, so all of those, those figure into my 
my awareness and my observations. Then we moved to little tiny Canyon City. And here I could almost outdo the, um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten his name already. Um, what? Richard, excuse me, Richard. Um, because Canyon City was 310 and we were five of the 10. So, <laughs> um, so that's where I got to grow up. I spent childhood and adolescence and teen years and I had total freedom. Once I did my chores, I could leave. I could go out, I could roam the hills, I could play in the little creeks, I could do whatever I wanted to do as long as I was home by dinner. I have no idea how I knew when it was dinner time, but anyway, I could, I could do that. I had that sort of freedom. And I roamed everywhere. And you know, I don't suppose there's a child alive now that could do this, because it was dangerous then. I'm, I'm very grateful my parents allowed me to do this, but it would be ridiculous now. Um, the dangers for me then were, you know, I was climbing castle rocks and I was looking for rattlesnakes and I was looking especially for gold mine shafts. Uh, Canyon City was, <laughs> Canyon City was called Muslin Town because so many people showed up looking for gold. And uh, the, the one little cultural thing we had was the 62 days to celebrate the discovery of gold in Canyon City. And, um, but I got to do all of that. If I had disappeared, I would have truly disappeared. Nobody would have ever known even which way to look. So uh, that kind of experience in that kind of uh, um, exquisite environment made me, again, intensely aware and, and observing. So. I had all of that, but I didn't have any exposure, not any exposure to art classes. I really didn't even have art magazines, um, didn't have galleries, museums, none of that, until when I was about 10 years old, my mother and little brother and I went cross country by train to visit her people in, in Kentucky and we went to Ohio, to Cincinnati. And Cincinnati had this amazing thing called a museum. A museum. I could not believe what I was seeing. You know, it just, here was all this stuff. All this stuff. Who could have thought of this stuff? Who did this stuff? And I was, I remember almost not being able to walk down the stairs. I was so trembly legged by just the experience of seeing this. And I came back and in a very few years left my beloved Eastern Oregon to come to the valley for school. And the first place I went was Mount Angel Academy for girls, which had Lee Kelly teaching at the college right across the driveway from the from the uh, academy. So that was a wonderful introduction to art. And uh, from there, directly to University of Oregon. <laughs> and here, I had something called basic design. Brian Ryan was teaching at the time, fabulous guy. Um, and I had Laverne Krauss. And I also met this young law student in his last year of school. And so my wonderful career in art sort of went by the wayside. Um, but I had this intense experience of uh, painting and painting and painting. We painted from models. And we had, we did exercises like that I thought, I, I just didn't understand why I would be doing this. And yet, it's something that I use for the rest of my life. It was a chart of tones, of values, and colors. You probably have done this. I'd never even seen it done. I didn't even really know what a color wheel was at the time. So we did probably hundreds of these things. And it was kind of transforming. It was kind of meditative. It was 
sort of launching into some other space with, with using this exquisite, magical stuff called paint that you could just do anything with. Paint is light. Paint is, it's, it's everything. It's the color. It's everything. It's tonality. It's everything you need to paint, if you're going to paint. And I do now live out in the country uh, after 17 years of living by fabulous 100-acre Bush Park, which was also pretty nice. But we uh, now live on a little acreage, about 13 acres, um, across this, the road from this. This is my view, one of my views, because I'm up on a hill. And so I have this pouring of light. All the light that is available is pouring down on me any time I want to look at it. And it is always, 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 always different. When I first moved out there, now I, I have five children, by the way, and they took a lot of time and attention. Um, but I was, <laughs> I was getting ready to go to the grocery store from my little country place. And I, I, we had immediately made the rule for ourselves that we would put together all of our errands so that we didn't make too many trips into town. But I got ready, got everything together, got my coat on, walked out the door and thought, wait a minute, I can't leave. Look at the sky. And I really couldn't leave. So I, I had to stay. I had to stay. I had to look. And I had to make notes and draw. And, and so that's what I do. My, I paint landscapes, but really my subject is light. And if you're observing the land and you're observing the light, you are observing the health of the planet. And where I live, when we first moved out here, it was full of little hedgerows. And, and those were full of peacock, uh, peacocks, no, pheasants and, and uh, all kinds of wildlife in the, these hedgerows, a little quail all over the road. Um, all of that's gone. It's almost all turned into vineyards. All the old trees have gone. We, we were part of an old oak savanna out there. And about the only oaks left standing are mine. And um, it's, it's been very hard to see those trees go. Uh, vineyards are pretty to look at, but they're a monoculture. And if they're, if they're not done really carefully, they're very hard on the earth. And um, so all, all of this underpins my work. There's a lot of um, darkness in my work, maybe, um, at least to me. And I build a canvas very, very, very slowly by a million applications of paint <laughs> that I scrub. I do the most physical. This looks like the paint was licked on. It wasn't. It was scrubbed in until there's three molecules left of that brush stroke, and then another brush stroke, and that's scrubbed in. And I, I start with stiff brush hole, bristled brushes that get about that long in a painting. So it's a very physical act, and, and it's something that I, First of all, I wonder how long I'll keep it up, but, <laughs> but it's, it's very satisfying to me, and it seems the only way I can um, get any kind of illusion of translucency and light with this extremely opaque material. Okay. <laughs> I just got a signal. <laughs> so, oh, <laughs> um, I don't... I don't think I have much more to say, um, but I'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have. So, <laughs> thank you. So, thank you, Bob. <laughs> so, I have some cards. If you, if you like, I'll pass this around. And so, <clears throat> I guess I have to. 
get the mic right next to me. <laughs> well, listening to everybody talk, uh, I asked uh, Daniel to be make me at the end, so I don't, I don't have to talk so much because time is running out. I said, but uh, so um, boy, where should I start? <laughs> When I start to, when I start to uh, say uh, my painting uh, has garbage, and some of the people said you should say a collage, and I said no, it's really garbage, and uh, so some people are slightly offended when I said it's garbage, well, because because it is my own garbage, but so. Um, so Danielle and the museum and uh, George and Jerry Heist and uh, George Green uh, Institute, I thank you for inviting me for, to be part of the show. Uh, like, like Richard and everybody else does, spoke about the, our connection to uh, Oregon State and Oregon, I, uh, I started Oregon State as a math and engineering student. And uh, after a year of uh, while well, doing calculus, chemistry, uh, physics, I wanted to do uh, something I would enjoy more. So I, I took a painting class my, I think, sophomore year. Or well, actually, I took a drawing class first. And then the first painting class I, I signed up, uh, Hugh Webb was in it. And then um, during the year, I think it was, must be Demetrius took us to uh, another room where George Green was making, uh, I assume, some kind of sculpture because he had a, a stick together and a cloth and a plaster with his finger all over it. And uh, although the reason I don't know what I'd really end up because I didn't stay to watch the whole thing because I knew it was going to be a long process, I went back to the classroom and, and I probably was painting. So. And speaking about uh, uh, Sangren too, I took a one watercolor class, uh, 19, must be 60, maybe fall of 62. And uh, I still use the same tool that I had to buy, uh, this egg carton that's, uh, it said Lusterware. I think now, I later became a Tupperware company, but. So I've been using the same Tupperware to paint watercolor class, I mean watercolor painting for, uh, well, must be 50, 56 years. <clears throat> so I, I have a show at PCC Slovenia campus recently, so I had my watercolor, class, um, watercolor, watercolor painting and drawing. So I showed my student my bag, which is all beat up with all the tools in it. But I said, I took one watercolor class, but I've been painting watercolor uh, for well, all these years plus. I think I figured out one time, I taught more water, watercolor student in Portland than anybody else. I think I, I, I was teaching uh, so many classes at the same time. So uh, anyway, for a while I was known as the watercolor painter, which is kind of ironic because I'm not doing too much watercolor anymore. But uh, so. Um, and then I actually came to Oregon in 1963, same year George and Karen and a uh, whole bunch of people moved at the same time, which I didn't know they were moving on the same year. And I was actually moved here as an architecture student, so, but I, I, was, uh, I took a painting class from uh, Jack Wilkinson first. And, uh, and I, I left after half a year, I think. And I, I spent time in the Army for three years in Europe. And uh, I spent a lot of time looking at the painting and stuff in museums there. And I decided, well, I'm not going to be an engineer. I'm probably not going to be an architect. So at least I came back to U of O as a painting major. And I had uh, a Vincent. And, and I think I had a Makash before. But so Makash became, uh, well, I think I said a couple of times, my second father, because we spent so much time together. And uh, after I left here in 69 uh, to go to art school in New York, 
uh, and came back, and I spent many hours with Makash visiting him, and uh, I would call, and then he would stand in front of his house waiting for me to show up. And, uh, <laughs> but, I, you know, obviously one day he passed away, and I always felt kind of bad because I should have even spent more time with uh, Makash and then, uh, than I had. So, um, uh, I was already probably, well, I used to like to paint on other people's paintings. So essentially, I was collaging or putting things on top of other people's work already anyway. When students actually got rid of their canvas, I was actually putting my painting on top of it, even as a student. And somewhere um, in the 50s, when I, I noticed uh, Robert Rauschenberg's painting and uh, also uh, Jasper John's, you know, they were collaging a lot of stuff in their work. Um, so somewhere in there, I started to put things in my painting, but it wasn't, in those days, I think I called them collages because they were just, uh, you know, cards somebody sent me or the letter that, you know, that somebody sent me or things that I didn't want to get, them, get rid of except that I, I thought I put them in my painting. So I was putting things that actually meant something to me. And uh, um, Mel Katz one day saw my painting and saw his postcard and he said, I'm not going to send you another paint, mother postcard because you put in me a painting or something like that. <laughs> so I said, no, I said, it's in my painting forever, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but um, 1990, when people are protesting about uh, uh, old growth timber being cutting in the uh, Opal Creek area. So my friend uh, Rick True and I took a hike one day. We spent all day probably, well, we should have done some research, but we ended up actually hiking in the creek bed for almost all day and then uh, almost couldn't get out because some of those steep hills were hard to get out of. So we had to, you know, grab the root system and come out of the canyon, but that made a lot of uh, difference to us. And Rick used to make this big wood sculpture using old uh, growth timber. So he, he quit uh, using it and started to make this, what I used to call ugly big uh, sculptures. He would use uh, cement and other materials and made these huge uh, sculptures. And around the same time, I, I actually was stopped already by my garbage service anyway because I didn't have much to uh, throw out in the garbage. So in 1990, I, uh, right after that trip, I, I tried to figure out a way to recycle things that you cannot recycle in a recycle bin or you can't even take it to the uh, Recycle center in those days that you could actually take things to a, a center that would take uh, well because they wouldn't take the odd number in those days. So you could take it odd number to certain places and they'll take it even though I don't know what they did with the thing that you got rid of. So I start to collect. Well, I would pick up garbage different places, but I didn't want to be cleaning that and taking my painting. So the the things that's in my painting are my own garbage that I, I couldn't recycle. So I, I started to collect them, and you know, pretty soon, every day, even though you're very careful, you still have a few things that you end up collecting. So my painting ended up being a way to recycle things that you, you cannot recycle in the uh, recycle bins. Anyway. So, so gradually, I was making my painting larger. And I, I got a commission from Clark Muscani one time to do a, a mural for their Clark Muscani Center. And so the mural was nine, nine and a half feet by uh, 30 feet wide. <laughs> but they didn't want me to put garbage in the, uh, <laughs> in the, the mural. <laughs> But that got me to thinking about painting bigger. So uh, uh, well, I would say before that, 
So 1993, uh, when I started to put this garbage in my painting, Stanley and I had a show in 1993. And so um, Joe Weinstein wrote an Oregonian about my painting. And, and he said to the effect that uh, uh, it was like looking at the landfill because, well, this is what he said. Um, so my friend Joe Weinstein wrote an article in the Friday Art Section of Oregon in September 17, 1993. He said, from afar, stay 15 feet across the gallery is a particularly convincing scene of a high mountain autumn. You'd swear the, the golden bough of cottonwood leaves in the foreground is swaying right off the canvas. When you get closer, you can see why the pieces resemble diorama in the Natural History Museum. It's apparent depth is quite real, for the artist had plastered the canvas with all manner of plastic rubbish and audaciously painted on it. There's enough uh, unrecyclable reef refuse here to start a small landfill. So um, there have been a few articles written about me, but um, that's how my uh, garbage uh, painting started. And uh, so I'm, I'm trying to, well, thing about painting, when you're painting f flat surface, it's one thing, but painting on the three-dimensional surface, <laughs> you, you know you have to deal with three-dimensional things looking flat from distance, too. So some of this, even though it's the same piece, become foreground and background at the same time. And so when you get right next to it, it, ne it may not make sense, but when you stand back, you know, this piece and this dark area become a separate spatial relationship. Anyway, <laughs> so I had to figure all this out as I was learning to paint. And maybe 10 years ago, whatever, the George came to my studio, he said, Bob, you have no technique. So, <laughs> so I, said, <laughs> I said, I'm avoiding technique because here, technique you learned how to paint, it doesn't really work anymore because you have to deal with, you know, three-dimensional surface. And also, the color and the shape of the things you're painting on top of. Which actually, it, even though it, uh, it looks hard, and it kind of is hard, but for, for me, it's very uh, enjoyable and fun to deal with. So, um, I, I passed out this uh, postcard. So after the uh, uh, commission from Clackamas County, I decided I, I was going to uh, make a larger studio. So I built the studio in 2006. So I started, well, my studio and house is pretty large. I could paint pretty big. But uh, studio, it's uh, now it's 16 feet high on one side and 14 feet on the other side. So. My painting, well, my studio height is higher than this, this ceiling. So I start to do this, thinking that I could make this in a couple of years. Well, I started in 2000, I think I put the canvas together in 2006, started painting in 2007, showed the painting like that in postcard in October 2007, and I showed it three times, I think, since. And then this is, uh, the picture that's in a book was taken in 2017, but 2018, which is last year, I probably painted quite a bit on it after the photograph was sent to the show here. So um, I'm one of the talking about, you know, I often said to students, when I was younger, I wanted to make more paintings. But now, I don't need to collect more my own painting in my studio, so I just need to be painting. So the, the longer I spend on one painting, which I actually like, because I don't have to start another painting. I just have to keep painting the same painting for a long time. And so I'm going to guess that this isn't still finished anyway. So <laughs> I already started a couple of paintings already, which have been working on for a couple of years. So, uh, uh, oh, so. Um, since people talked about landscape painting in uh, 
a certain way. But what I like to say is, um, ever since I think I was a child, well, because we live in this physical world, looking at the landscape as part of our surroundings, um, I don't know which part I should tell first, but maybe I'll say this one first. You know, when you grew up in Japan, uh, we didn't have art teachers. We didn't have none of that. We, the teacher just stayed outside to say, do something. <laughs> so, so as a child, I used to go outside and figure out how to make a painting. And I, know, I still remember clearly one day I was sitting down and trying to paint or draw this uh, house in a, some distance, sitting down. <laughs> and then, of course, I drew the house fairly large on a piece of paper, but it didn't look right because it looked like it was closer to me. So I erased it, made it smaller. And then it still didn't look right, so I remember thinking, well, I gotta make it smaller yet. So physically, I realized you could make a picture on a piece of paper and show the space that makes sense to you. You know, so, so that's how my landscape relationship started. Not from, really from my teachers, because I don't remember them ever talking to me about how to do landscape painting. But, but, you know, most of us, even though you're teachers, what we learn is really from your own relationship to the world anyway. So when I start to do these large paintings um, for Clackamas County, I decided to do a, a, a riverscape of Clackamas River because, well, it's part of the county. So I started to go around and taking photographs, even though I knew that the way we look at the world, even though the Western world said, you stand still and look at the space and you get this perspective. Well, you know, we don't really look at the world in that way. We actually look at the world by looking here, looking here, looking here, looking here, and looking down, looking up, and looking further. Well, this painting, I'm actually standing on a, a rock. And mainly I wanted to paint the water, so I'm taking photograph of the water in front of me. And then I take in the photograph above because you don't see the whole thing. You actually see them in sections anyway. So you look in here, look in here, look in there. Right? So I'm looking down, looking here, looking up. And then I go to the right. And then so, so I have a, a series of photographs even though they don't all match up right. But, you know, close enough. And so I so if you actually look at the painting, you should have a sense of me looking to the right, to the slightly this way, to the center. So it should kind of surround you a little bit. And also, if you, if you get slightly different, you should have a sense of looking at the water down and then looking at straight up and then looking slightly up. So it's a made up of series of uh, how we actually look at the bigger world anyway. And <laughs> this creek isn't that wide, so painting make it look like it's a bigger creek than it really is because I'm actually looking all the way across. So uh, that's how this painting is made. And again, pretty much everything that's in here is my garbage that I, ha I can't uh, recycle. So, you know, all the stuff that uh, packaged up and, uh, yeah, anyway. And, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, there was one question. My studio is wide enough. Well, my studio is wide enough so I could paint. But but George asked me about this. What well, George Green? He had this notion of my large painting being here, and his large painting on the other door. So when you actually come up, 
you could see my painting and you could see George's painting. So that was his plan. I, and, and I actually appreciate that because, well, because usually, um, well, at the Blackfish Gallery, I don't know how, how deep the space is, uh, track light is not so high. So I, technically, I made the top of the canvas to fit Blackfish space. And that's, the wall is 12 feet wide, and I think the ceiling is slightly over 12 feet. So I made the painting to fit that space, but I never had enough space to uh, look right. So this is probably the first time this painting looked right in a space, except in my studio. Yeah, so, you know, I, I, uh, because usually people don't have space to show a large painting uh, this size. So, uh, anyway. And, and the curatorial aspect of that, too, I'll mention that often when we're planning our gallery layouts, some of the first decisions we make are what are the works that viewers will see as they approach the galleries, and especially for our galleries that all have multiple uh, entry points, so you know that you're not directing everyone to have the exact same experience of entering the same door or walking in the same direction. Um, but that is one of the conversations we have internally or with the artists as we're thinking about where to display the work with these main doors and, and knowing that we had two works that were the size they were of Bob's and George's um, painting, Instantaneous Everything, opposite the other doors. I think early on we identified those as works that we wanted to kind of hold the space, knowing how far up the stairs you'd be seeing the work as you approach. Um, so another consideration with this gallery too and doing the layout, even though we made some adjustments in moving around works um, and going through a few different ideas for the layout, was that the show originally came out of a conversation um, years ago with George and Jerry and Terry Melton and Susan Trueblood Stewart, long before they had approached our museum to pitch the idea of a partnership. And it worked out in this gallery that I placed. So we placed Terry Melton's works on one corner, roughly to, in that corner, George's, Susan's on that corner, and Jerry's on this corner, sort of anchoring the gallery, um, which is kind of just a nod to that that you wouldn't get from reading wall labels or anything outside of just needing to know who those people were and what their role was in the origins of the show. I think there was maybe one more question for you around the corner. I'm going to repeat that question just in case anyone couldn't hear the whole question because that was really great in thinking about um, the logistics of moving the painting and making decisions about how you place the work, especially something that's as large as it is. So I should always make my painting to fit my van. Oh, okay. And so, but, so this, this um, so normally each section is never that wide. So, um, <laughs> so it's not, it's easy to move, and it's not that heavy either. I mean, because I, I move it by myself most of the time. <clears throat> the other thing is, um, when I decided to do certain uh, landscape or riverscape, I have an idea, and so I make the canvas. I actually make the shape, and then if you look at the back, and I also make it so that it won't be so heavy. And so it's probably a lot flimsier than other people's canvas maybe, but you know, I was also a carpenter, so I know that you don't have to make everything overbuilt because usually people do this anyway. So, and then <laughs> I would say I spent a week each panel organizing it. <laughs> and then another week by gluing this together uh, or maybe even longer. So before I even put a paint on, I already probably have a month in it anyway. And then, um, even if you're, you're planning, it doesn't matter by the time you glue it, it probably has moved quite a bit. So, and then, but, but it's also, <laughs> it's fun to have things not in the right place because you have to solve that problem too. And so, uh, you know, everybody talks about it, you know, I mean, some places it's been painted 20 times maybe, 30 times. <clears throat> because when you paint other parts, 
some other parts need to change, otherwise it doesn't work together. So then, even though your intention was to put certain shape in a certain place, it doesn't work out that, that way. And so, but you just have to convince, well, fear me first, and then the audience, that it looks right. That's the bottom line, actually. So, you know, because my case, I'll say, it doesn't matter if it doesn't look right to somebody else. It looks right to me, so that's, that's what matters anyway. Because painting is by you, not somebody else. So I try to make it right for myself. I mean, it's been like that since I was a child. So, uh, yeah, you know, and I, I didn't listen to my teacher that well either, but. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That wore out, and, the, and, 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 then, and then it got a hole, and, and, and lost my bottom. And then I had this, I, I, I put the, I, I, I had some shoes in time, and, you know, and then, uh, uh, yeah, you know, kitchen uh, sponge and, you know, toothbrush and, uh, Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our artists today. And please come back in May to hear Laura Ross Paul and Jerry Heise and Connie Keener and George Johansson speak about their work and how they approach um, representing the human figure. And please um, continue to bring people to sh see the show. We've loved to see the we've loved seeing the reaction and how many of the artists have brought friends and family to see this exhibition um, while it's still on view through mid-May. So thank you again for your time today, and we'll see you again soon.